Hello, and welcome to the Producers Guild conversation with the creative team behind WandaVision. We'd like to thank our friends at Disney and Marvel Studios for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Janelle Riley. Janelle is the Deputy Awards and Features Editor at Variety and a host and screenwriter who has received three Emmy Awards for her work on Actors on Actors. Welcome Janelle, welcome panelists, and Janelle, please take it away. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. I am so pleased to be here with this incredible feat that is WandaVision. Uh, at this time, please join me in welcoming today's guests who pulled off this funny, tragic, beautiful limited series. We have President of Marvel Studios, Chief Creative Officer of Marvel, and Executive Producer Kevin Feige. We have the Creator for Television, Executive Producer, and Head Writer Jack Schaefer. The Director of All Nine Episodes and Executive Producer Matt Shackman. And the show's Co-Executive Producer Mary Lovanos. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, Whenever I have people as accomplished as you, I actually like to go back to what are tend to be humble beginnings and, and ask, what was your first job in this business? Are you someone who you know, started in the mail room, was a PA? Uh, you know, what was the first thing you ever wrote or directed? And let's start with Jack. Oh my gosh, <clears throat> what a great question. I'm so excited to hear from my colleagues because I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, my first paying gig, I was, I was, an, I was a production set assistant. Um, on a tiny movie that went straight to video, which used to be a thing. Um, and it was in New York in the winter. And my main memory is I got a callus on my chin from the coat that I wore in the freezing, freezing. And I carried a lot of trash and got a lot of coffee. And it was awesome. I loved every second of it. And I bet that you are so nice to production assistants on your own sets. <laughs> Yeah, well, and when people ask me for advice, I'm always like, you gotta, you gotta have one of those humiliating jobs so that you know what kind of boss you don't want to be. Oh, that is great advice. <laughs> Matt, what about for you? You know, my story is kind of similar. Uh, it involves some humiliation as well. Um, it was a Pepsi commercial because I was a child actor. So my very first job was a Pepsi commercial. And I was on the shoulders of a guy playing my dad on a beach somewhere here in Los Angeles for hours and hours and hours. And I mentioned that I kind of had to go to the bathroom a few times and nobody would let me down because they were busy shooting and the director had to get the shot. Um, so I ended up not being able to hold it. And uh, the poor guy who was playing my dad had a rude awakening. Um, and so I am very empathetic for my child actors and uh, you know, try to be a much better director than that guy. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that you know what that is a that is a good lesson for people to listen to your actors and, and kids especially. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, what about for you? Um, well, I did have a lot of internships. I went to USC. Um, and actually one of my first internships was at Marvel back when Marvel Studios was in Manhattan Beach and uh, I delivered the mail. There was uh, a bike that I rode back and forth across a lot. Um, I sold DVD box sets at Comic-Con, but I did get to do a lot of uh, creative research, which was fantastic. And it was a good experience. <laughs> That's so cool. You literally began in the mail room. <laughs> sure did. <laughs> That's amazing. And Kevin, what about for you? Um, <clears throat> my first gig, I was an, I was an actor, uh, in a Pepsi commercial playing a father and I had this kid <laughs> on my shoulders and I don't even want to get into what happened. At, oh, no. Um, I was also an intern. I was an intern, uh, for a year, year and a half, two years. Uh, and then I was a receptionist, uh, at the company and then I was a PA and then I was an assistant. So I very much, uh, yes, the, the, the mail room equivalent at a production company. Okay, now I'm curious if you've ever done any acting because you were very convinced. You had me fooled for a second just now. And I was like, he's good. No, never. <laughs> well, I want to start at the beginning with WandaVision and I'm just going to get my fangirling out of the way now because there's so much I admire about this series. I mean, you could have played it safe, but instead you took huge risks. You trusted the audience, these incredible artists, and it paid off so beautifully. I know there's a lot of planning ahead in the Marvel world, but at what point did you sort of begin to develop the idea for the series and specifically the format and story you ended up telling? Um, well, it was <clears throat> it was relatively early on and soon after 
uh, Bob Iger had told us about uh, a streaming service and that he wanted Marvel Studios to to um, come up with with shows for this streaming service, which was incredibly exciting for for all of us at Marvel Studios. We were in the in the throes of finishing Infinity War and Endgame at that time, our, our two Avengers films. And it really was for years we've been thinking about the culmination of everything we've done in, in what we call the Infinity Saga. And I was sort of figuring out what can come next and what do I want to do and how do we keep the enthusiasm and the, and the creative uh, opportunities going at a place after we've already done 23 features. Um, and Disney Plus really allowed us to do that. And uh, with WandaVision in particular, we always knew that we wanted to see more of Lizzie Olsen and see more of Paul Bettany and, and have them be the focus of something as opposed to supporting players as they'd been uh, in the Avengers films. Uh, so that was sort of a, a no brainer to, to say, we wanna explore more of them. They've got great and wonderful storylines in the comics. The sitcom element came um, just from sort of an obsession I have and, and everyone you see on this uh, Zoom have is a shared obsession with sitcoms and with television history. And um, as we were in the, you know, rather stressful days of, uh, of uh, doing back-to-back -back Avengers movies, I found solace in watching sitcoms as I would get ready for the day and how, and how uh, simplistic it was and how a problem arises and is solved within 23 and a half minutes and how that, that was very, very uh, comforting to me but I also knew was incredibly false and incredibly, um, it, it was all basically a, a lie. So how do you, how do you uh, but a very pleasant and comforting lie that I still uh, uh, rely on. Um, so how do, you, how do you utilize that to tell this, this story of, uh, of Wanda and Vision and Wanda in particular? The truth is um, we met with, with a lot of people who just simply didn't get it. So having an idea is one thing. Finding people who share the passion for that idea and can actually turn it into something is uh, something entirely different, which is where Mary and Jack and Matt come in. Mary, as someone who's been with Marvel since, I guess, an internship, um, when you hear an idea like this, uh, you know, is it exciting? Is it intimidating? What were sort of your, your initial reactions to this? Um, well, Kevin called me into his office back in the summer of 2018. And you know, I, I, I was um, a fan of sitcoms, but not, uh, I didn't, the, the obsession didn't run as deep as Kevin's went. Um, so it was, it was intimidating when I first heard about the premise because I knew I needed to do my homework, which began right away. Um, but it was a real pleasure to start to really dive in to all these old sitcoms, which hold up so well, especially Dick Van, the Dick Van Dyke show. Um, and from there, it was um, a, a quick, a quick uh, a study of, you know, old episode formats, um, how those problems were resolved quickly within just 25 minutes, um, what the typical setups were, what the episode titles looked like, um, examining the sitcoms from sort of the micro and macro um, views in order to have an understanding of like how that could start. Um, you know, how, how do we begin the osmosis process with Wanda um, and Vision? Um, so it, it was intimidating, but it became uh, increasingly more fun. And that view uh, uh, was very optimistic once we brought Jack on and uh, we assembled our incredible, incredible writer's room. And Jack, when I heard you were doing this, I felt like it was such a perfect fit because as, as I told you before we started, I'm a huge fan of your film Timer, which, is a rom-com premise, but then puts this really unique twist on it. Um, what intrigued you about coming onto the series and, and how did you feel you could bring your specific voice to it? Um, th thank you, first of all, so much for um, for your comments about Timer. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. My, my, the, the work that I love is when there's some sort of bananas premise or gimmick or way in that seems impossible or how do you make it work or you know how do you integrate these things like those are those are my favorite opportunities and when I heard about this I was I was um 
I was writing on Black Widow and one of the executives in the room um, was prepping some documents on it. And he like told me just like a little bit of a, this is what, this is a thing that's happening. And I was like, how do I, how do I, how do I get out of this room and into that room? I love this room, but oh my God, what is that? And how is that going to work? And, and I was like, this is, wow, that's going to, that's going to be a bust. How do you make that? <laughs> how can that possibly hang together? But um, then when I was invited to pitch on it, I, you know, I had to sort of figure that out. Um, and and the challenge of it was so irresistible. How are we going to make people care? And it ended up—I mean, it was—it was—it was very challenging breaking it and figuring out the mythology and and being sort of disciplined and and keeping it cohesive, you know. And we had this, as Mary said, a remarkable writers' room um, who made all that possible. But really, it came down to um, to Paul and Lizzie, Wanda and Vision, and and hanging everything on their love and and Wanda's authentic emotional experience, um, and that's that's what we return to time and again. And Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're you're the newbie to the Marvel world. <laughs> um, what interested you in being a, a attached to this project, and specifically, I keep saying this, directing all nine episodes, which I kind of can't believe you did. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a newbie to the Marvel Studios world, but not new to being a Marvel fan. You know, I was, at the same time that I was, you know, urinating on strange men on beaches, I was also, you know, obsessed with Marvel comics and Marvel characters. And I used to dress up like Spider-Man every day to school until my preschool teacher told me that that was not healthy and that I needed to dress like a normal kid. So um, this is a dream come true for me in that it was this weird way of bringing together my passion for Marvel and also my weird history as a child actor. Um, you know, uh, WandaVision was a trip down uh, memory lane for me uh, every day. Um, and in some ways, you know, it, it's very much a therapy project for Wanda as she deals with grief and loss, but it was absolutely a therapy project for me too, as I was able to encounter my past. I want to talk about the look of the series, or actually I should say looks, because you really take viewers through this amazing journey with a tribute, to, starting with a tribute to classic sitcoms, you know, and then sort of taking us through decades of familiar television. Can you talk about um, how you pulled off these amazing looks? Is, I assume it's a conversation between all of you um, and the idea of doing something that is both homage and yet completely original. What, what are those conversations like? You know, it's, we, we always talked about authenticity being the most important thing that we wanted to avoid appearing like it was a parody or a spoof because the real truth that lingers under the surface is that this is Wanda trying to escape a tremendous amount of loss. And it really is a world that she's created for herself. So it has the logic and the, the coherence that she's bringing to it. And she can create realities out of whole cloth. And so we, we knew that the world she created had to have incredible integrity so we were researching all of the department heads, everyone who worked on the show, obviously Jack and the writers, everyone was, was doing a deep dive into television history, looking at old prints, you know, interviewing people who had made these shows to try to put their finger on what made them work and, what, and how they were special because they were so special. And the ones that we chose to focus on had sort of stood the test of time. So we wanted to make sure that we, we honored those references, but ultimately built something new. We wanted to build WandaVision, not just you know, the reference points. And Kevin, as a fan of, you know, all these sitcoms, what was it, what was it like to see these worlds recreated and like, you know, get to step on these stages? Well, it was, it was remarkable. The first, uh, the first episode and being even simply being on a black and white set or a, a set that will be in black and white on television. And yet seeing the color tones that they found that they match so well, um, not for what is supposed to look good to color for the eye, but what will look good in black and white. Uh, that was really, that was really very, uh, very, very cool. And of course, the live studio audience that uh, that we had that day um, was something we'd never obviously experienced before. This may sound like a silly question, but when you know there's going to be a live studio audience, um, Jack, does it change the writing at all? Um. I, I, strangely, no. I feel like my answer should be like, yes, we're so flexible, and like, and we no. It, it was it was like a play, and Matt directed it like a play, and and 
they had been, you know, we'd been rehearsing it for a week and kind of dialing it in. And, and we were, as Matt said, we were aspiring to the sort of the elegance and the tightness and, and the professionalism, the polish of, of Dick Van Dyke. So it was all very set, but what it did and what we were hoping it would do is, is really goose the performances that there would be sort of a, an electricity to what we got on the day. And I think we all agree there absolutely was for everybody. I mean, we were all dressed, you know, period appropriate and the audience was all instructed to, to dress according to the period. And they, they, you know, it was a lot of friends and family. And so there was, um, yeah, there was so much kind of love and warmth and it felt very, um, almost childlike, like everybody was just like a fan and we were doing this thing. And um, so it was, it at that point, the writing that that part was over, we were just in the experience and, and, um, and trying to capture the magic. Something Marvel is known for is its amazing SAG award winning ensembles. Um, this is no exception. Obviously you have the great Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany. Um, my favorites, Kat Dennings and Randall Park, who I want to have a spin off together. Um, can you talk about sort of rounding out the rest of the cast? I guess starting with the great Catherine Hahn, I feel like she's such a perfect fit for this universe. I'm, I'm so glad you got her in there at last. I mean, Catherine was somebody who was always like, oh, Catherine Hahn would be great. But I think she was, you know, unavailable for such a long time. She was, and so it was always, oh yeah, someone like Catherine Hahn. And then she came in for a general meeting at Marvel. And I think, Mary, you were in that general meeting, right, with Lou. And she was like, oh, no, I guess I am available. And all of a sudden we were like, what? Um, and so this person who had been the sort of paradigm of what that part could be was suddenly available. And she's the best. I've known her for years. Um, I've done theater with her husband over the years. And, um, and I knew that she was that kind of person that we needed who was so exceptionally talented in any, any genre, tone, or style. And you know, she's so playful, but yet she can be so terrifying when she needs to be, and so funny. Um, and so we were looking for, for basically this amazing unicorn and she kind of walked right in. So it was great. Mary, you had been sort of, I don't know if I want to say pursuing her for a while, but interested in her for a while. Um, I was just a fan. I, I'm a huge fan of Catherine Hans. Um, you know, I think when I was watching the Romanoffs, I just skipped right past everything else. Catherine Hahn episode. I binged all of, I love Dick, transparent. Um, Afternoon Delight. I'm just a huge fan of what she's done for so long, especially in the indie space. Um, and when, yeah, Lou's assistant uh, asked me if I wanted to join a general, I think my eyes fell out of my face. Um, I was so, so excited to meet her. Um, and weirdly enough, I'm not, I don't, I don't follow talent that closely often, but Catherine Hahn, yes, is definitely one of those actors who is just absolutely uh, magnetic. So it was, uh, a serious light bulb moment sitting across from her and she came in the very next day and we offered her the role it was it was it was magic knowing you'd been watching her for a while i'm trying to mentally imagine where she could have appeared sooner like <laughs> mentally recasting roles in my mind that 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 she could have <laughs> played but i mean this this worked out perfectly she's she's so wonderful in this and also um tiana paris who plays a grown-up monica rambo it's so interesting when you have to cast someone knowing that they'll be carrying the character into future projects. Can you sort of talk about, you know, landing on her? Uh, yeah, you know, um, having worked a little bit on Captain Marvel 1, um, the young actress who played Monica there, Akira Akbar, was such a bright light, so full of joy and wonder. We were looking for more or less the, the same thing, but amplified um, for Monica in WandaVision and obviously knowing that she would likely move on to um, the feature side as well, which she, which she now is, um, Tiana is, is just that. And she was so ready to play ball. And she, she really wanted to embody the scientist um, and incredibly intelligent woman that little Monica Rambo grew up to be. And we would just, we had a science advisor that worked closely with Jack and we would just give her these giant chunks of dialogue that were just filled with gobbledygook. And she she was able to deliver it uh, uh, perfectly. And she's also just so empathetic. Um, you know, at, at the core, Monica needed to be a character who, I mean, her big her heroic moment is empathy. It's knowing enough to know that 
the day wouldn't be saved just by shutting Wanda down. She needed an ally, which um, Tiana was able to deliver beautifully. I'm curious for each of you, um, what ended up being the biggest challenge on the series, like a specific scene or even just a moment, because you're dealing with really this amazing mix of genres that, that walks, you know, this very fine line. You've got a sprawling ensemble. You've kind of got like multiple storylines. I just, I, I really just, sorry for lack of a better word, I marvel at how well it came off. Um, so I'm really just sort of curious if there was a moment for each of you that, that you know, was the biggest challenge. Well, I, I mean, I'll start and say, and say the biggest challenge was finding <clears throat> collaborators who were excited by the challenge. I mean, the truth is Jack was working on, on, on Black Widow at the time. We were having other, other meetings and there came a point I don't remember exactly how many meetings it was, Mary, three or four or five meetings with other writers. Uh, and one of the, you know, the, a number of them were saying, you know, we really love these two characters, but the sitcom, do you need the sitcom element? What if you lost the sitcom element? Maybe that, that might folks it in. And I thought, that's the whole reason to do, that's the whole show. So clearly we're not finding the right people if they're not, if they're willing to say, hey, I really love this, but how about we jettison that? So the fact that meanwhile, in another room at Marvel Studios, Jack was hearing about it and being excited by the high fail potential of it, which is often how the best ideas come about, um, was great. And then as we were looking for filmmakers, uh, we'd met Matt a few times. He's done what I will unabashedly say I think is my favorite episode of Game of Thrones. And I only knew him as a director of premier gigantic television, which we also wanted this to be. The fact that he was a child actor, I don't know if, I don't think he's talked about that much in, in his other director meetings, but he brought it up this time. And I thought how amazing somebody who literally his entire life has been spanning the two worlds that we want this show to embody. The, the world of, of, of authentic sitcoms and big premiere television. So for, for me personally, it was when the collaborators you see on the screen came together that, uh, that our, our first big challenge was, was overcome. Jack, what about for you? Um, I think for me, it was, it was the finale um, in general. Uh, uh, you know, the kind of the Twilight Zone stuff and the Lynchian stuff and and writing a sitcom. I'd never done that before, but I've been a comedy writer. And so none of that was easy. It required a huge amount of effort. But um, but landing the finale was was hard. I, I sort of my my sort of structural design for the show was to push the majority of the blasty blasty MCU stuff to the end. And then and then it was a lot to figure out you know, Agatha's arc and the mythology and the Scarlet Witch of it and where are we landing these things and handing it off to, you know, Strange 2 and, and, and all of that. Um, and it, and it, it was the, it was the script that took the longest. Um, but luckily, you know, Matt and, and Mary were such incredible collaborators with the constant evolving of that, that particular um, episode. Um, and then we also, we, we had, we had a, a, a forced break um, with um, the pandemic. And so we had some time after we had shot the bulk of the series um, to sort of sit and deliberate and make sure we were, um, we were sticking the landing and fulfilling every, all the promise of the series. Um, but it was, it was the, the episode that went through the ringer the the most number of times oh i'm sure matt for you yeah i mean i agree with jack about the finale so i guess i won't take that one um <laughs> but it was you know it definitely was re-engineered many times but it was just trying to find the way to end this incredible story that you know jack had created and finding a way to stick it but i will say the one thing that never changed in that finale is the end of the the vision and wanda story which is something that jack locked into very early on and that scene of saying goodbye to vision saying goodbye to the kids that didn't change and it was gorgeous when it was written gorgeous when it was shot and that's how it was you know so always the emotional end where um jack wanted to take it was always there you know and um and it was just about how do you get all these players on a chessboard to kind of go where they need to be and balance the storylines and keep things focused. But um, the emotional payoff was always there. So mine quickly is just the 70s because um, that is such a tricky decade to not parody like sideburns and bell bottoms and all that. And it was such a complicated tone because you know, it could go big and, and it should go big, but it has to go big without forgetting the stakes. And we had, there was so much going on narratively in that episode because it's, the reality is breaking apart and breaking through a little bit more in that episode. We're sort of building towards the kind of 
opening up the curtain and showing what's really going on and you have a stork running around and so that one was probably the trickiest one stylistically tonally um and but also maybe the most fun one for that reason too i mean they say never work with children or animals and you did both and and you did the unforgivable you killed a dog in your series and people still went with you <laughs> yeah sorry <Very> <laughs> I, I'm sure you all knew you were making something special at the time, but have you been at all surprised by the impact the series has had? I mean, people are, are so rhapsodic about it. And like I said, you took big risks and you probably didn't know if they would pay off, but you know, to see, to see people, you know, quoting, you know, what is grief if not love persevering to see, you know, apparently I don't explain myself well, because people are constantly sending me the, the gif of, uh, white vision saying I request elaboration <laughs> <laughs> and it, it really like has has worked its way into the vernacular in a, in, in a way that you know it's not uncommon for Marvel but but really special uh, you know did it, did it catch you at all off guard well I, I think yes you you we've been lucky to to have zeitgeist moments this sort of intentionally was designed to to be very, very different. And as I said, to go from rooms where we would pitch writers um, and their thought was drop the sitcom element to a point where the world embraces that, whether they grew up with any of these shows or not, um, I think was to this level was, uh, was a, a, great, uh, a great joy and, and surprise to me. The fact that it was happening week by week um, was also extraordinary. I mean, we were mirroring obviously the way television had been delivered for so many years, but the fact that um, you know, we were having this conversation that was going on in a, in a world that's used to binge watching was exciting. People's theories, um, TikTok videos, memes, all of that stuff was, was just wonderful. And we had made it with so much passion and so much attention to detail that to see the world receive it with just as much passion and even more attention to detail um, was really extraordinary. I think, you know, I think we had high hopes that it would be surprising, you know, I think especially, I mean, it was certainly designed, especially the first three episodes, two of which are black and white, we were really hoping to, to kind of have jaws on the floor and how, and how daring, you know, the show is in, in the superhero space. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, we never could have predicted that it would debut at the exact moment that it was um, desired. Um, and I, I've never been a part of something that had this kind of serendipity. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I, I mean, I personally spent the last year sinking into the content that I love as a way to cope and, and manage my feelings and my grief. So um, it's extraordinary. It, it does feel like um, I, I didn't, I personally never anticipated this kind of a thing, but it, it does feel like there was, there was some magic and some spell cast um, with this show. And I, I'll forever be grateful for that. It was really nice. You know, I think it was funny. I remember trying to pitch the show to my mom while we were still writing it and she was so confused as you know not a marvel person but a sitcom fan um we were it was definitely one of those things where you hold your breath um thinking about how fans of this old genre and fans of just the mcu how those two worlds would collide and it's um been really lovely to see the response and how open um and passionate people are about both and the the melding of both and did your mom watch the series? Was she a fan? Oh, she's a super fan. <laughs> I heard that a lot where, you know, grandparents would explain the Dick Van Dyke show to grandkids and grandkids would explain the MCU to grandparents. And I think there's nothing better than that, especially as Jack said, in the moment we've all just been through this idea of television being about hearth and home. And here you are gathering in, you know, your home with your family and able to connect around one thing is really special. Well, again, it is it is such a phenomenal uh, feat that you all pulled off. I want to thank you so much for being here today. I want to thank you for for taking risks and and I guess there's no other way to say it, just not messing it up. I mean, <laughs> it's really really um, special, and I, I am so appreciative. Thank you. Thank so you, Janelle. Thanks so much. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you.